What does the future hold? Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The Book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. Welcome to Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. When you begin reading the Bible in the book of Genesis, in Genesis 1 and 2, we've got a perfect world. But then there is the sad drama of sin, the fall of Adam and Eve. And throughout the Bible, men and women longed for a new world. And when the Bible ends in Revelation 21 and 22, God reveals that new world. That new world blossoms forth in all its beauty and magnificence, and the reign of sin is over. In this presentation, we're going to look at Revelation and the final conflict between good and evil and its climax with the triumph of Christ and the glories of heaven. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you're in charge of this world. Sometime we only see the ugliness. We see the dark side. But we know the light is bursting forth. Soon Christ will come. And one day soon, time will fade into eternity. So grant to us a vision of hope as we study your new world in Christ's name. Amen. Our topic in this presentation is Revelation's World of Tomorrow. You know, a survey was taken not long ago on people's attitudes toward heaven. And one man said this. He said, heaven man, that's pie in the sky. Out there somewhere, it's unreal. I just can't fathom it. Somebody else put it this way. Heaven is a state of mind. It's an inner peace. It's a state of calm. Somebody else said, heaven, it's my house. It's worth three million. My chariot, it's, it's my, that's my jaguar. And the angels, they're my kids. Now, I don't know about if you'd say your angels are your kids or not, you know, but and I don't know if your house is worth three million either. But you see, people have this distorted idea about heaven. One young millennial said this, heaven is, are you so out of touch that you still believe in those fairy tales? A couple who had gotten older said, we hope heaven is a real place. You see, the older we get, the more we long for it. We just hope that what we're taught in our childhood is true. You know, when you look at the subject of heaven, there are so many different ideas, so many different ways that people understand heaven, but yet the Bible is very clear. What is heaven? Is heaven a real place? Will we have real bodies? Will we know one another in heaven? What will we do through the ceaseless ages of eternity? Will we sit on a cloud and play a harp and uh, simply float through the cosmic atmosphere? What really is heaven all about? What really is heaven like? Now this, as among other subjects, truth is stranger than fiction. Heaven is more magnificent, it's more glorious, it's more exciting, more thrilling, more real than we could ever imagine. Heaven is a real place. Now, the key to understanding heaven is to understand Revelation 21. And Revelation 21, verse 1 says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth are passed away. Here is the key to understanding heaven that God created the world once in its Edenic splendor, and that one day God is going to recreate again this Edenic splendor on earth. In fact, you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5? He said, the meek shall inherit the earth. And so if you understand that heaven's not some fantasy world, heaven is not some make-believe world, heaven is not some world of dreams, but heaven is a real place. It is a recreated earth that you and I will live on. Now, each of the prophets from Genesis to Revelation pointed men and women forward to the new heavens and the new earth. When God created the world, he created it beautiful, the Garden of Eden. 
What is heaven? It's heaven, it's Eden restored. It's the world recreated in Edenic splendor. Once again, clear crystal water will flow. Once again, the birds will sing, babbling brooks will dance through the landscape. And once again, the sky will be blue and the sun will shine and there'll be green verdure on the hillside. Yet as you look at this world, we see pollution. But in that world of Eden, the fruit was pure, uncontaminated, no pesticides, no GMOs. You know, it was a natural diet that God gave to us in the beginning. And the trees were so amazingly loaded with fruit that they were bowed over. And Adam and Eve lived off the products of the land. Animals didn't have any fear of human beings in that land. The elephant and the horse, uh, the, the zebra uh, and the lion, all the animals together were joyous and happy. And Adam and Eve experienced that joy as Jesus taught them about the garden. There was love and joy and companionship. It's difficult for us to imagine, really, isn't it? What heaven will be like. And it's difficult for us to imagine what Eden was like. When you think about it, living in a land where there's no fear, living in a land where there's no worry, living in a land where there's no anxiety, living in a land where there's no pain, where there's no suffering, where there's no death, no flower dies, no fruit rots, no babies are born dead, no bombs drop, no children with their legs blown off because they've stepped on a landmine. You know, you just try to grasp that. You just try to think about that. And uh, what must it have been like for Adam and Eve to walk through Eden with the perfumed air, no air pollution, and breathing the flowers just so energetic, and eating the fruit so health-giving, and never in argument disappointment. But then the Bible says that an intruder suggested to Eve that sin would bring greater happiness than obedience. And she bought into that lie. And when she did and gave the fruit to Adam and he ate, the sad drama of sin began. And as it began, heartache and suffering, disappointment and tears and pain entered in to the human family and the human race. Adam and Eve were expelled from that garden. But down through the ages, men and women, the prophets of God, were part of the royal line of faith. They looked forward to the day that there'd be a new heavens and a new earth. They looked forward to the day that Eden would be restored. And God has put that desire in every one of our hearts. Watching this telecast today, you know that we're made for something better than this. You read the headlines and you see a terrorist break into a church and begin going pew by pew shooting people. And you see a seven-month-old baby with bullets in its head killed in the arms of a mother. You see a pregnant woman shot. You see young people shot and retirees shot. Or you turn on the news and you hear about terrible conflict in the Middle East and a child steps on a landmine and blows off its legs and lies bleeding to death. Or you read in the newspaper about a drunk man that comes home and beats his wife and her nose is broken and blood drips down and she wipes it with her tongue and you, you read about India or Africa and children starving to death and what happens? Deep within your heart you know that's not right. Deep within your heart, you know, we were made for a better world than this. We were made for something better than poverty, made for something better than suffering, made for something better than heartache, made for something better than pain, made for something better than death. And the royal line of faith down through the centuries, generation after generation, looked forward to that better world. Abraham looked forward to it. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 12, for he, Abraham, waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. As he journeyed through this world, Abraham cried out for a new world. Moses brought up a child of Egypt. And the Bible says, 
Hebrews 11, verse 24 to 26, by faith Moses, when he came of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures of Egypt. What did he do? He looked to the reward. Why is it that Moses could step out of the Egyptian luxury and pleasure because he looked for the reward. He was looking toward heaven. And the Bible ends Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 and 14 with these words. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. What promises? The promise of eternal life, the promise of heaven. But having seen them afar off, were assured of them. They embraced them and confessed them that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You and I are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You're walking, you're going shopping one day at one of the great grocery stores. You get out of your car and you see a friend and they say, where are you going? And you say, well, I'm on my way to heaven. I'm just a pilgrim, a stranger. You're stopping off to get a little food here. <laughs> no, you better not say that. Some think you're crazy, right? <laughs> but it's really true, isn't it? We are what? We are pilgrims and strangers on the earth. This is not our home. This is not our permanent dwelling place. We are here for a short momentarily minute of time. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 and 14, for those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. Whoever you are watching this telecast, I know that you're seeking a homeland. You're seeking something better than we have. You're seeking a place where love reigns. You're seeking a place where joy reigns. You're seeking a place in eternity where we'll never fear death again. A place where every talent can be expanded and every capacity can de be developed. A place where we can travel from star to star and to world to world and explore the vast technologies of civilizations that have never fallen by sin. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16, it says, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. There's something better than this. What do you say? Something better than aging, something better than death, something better than sorrow, something better than tears. The Bible says they desire something better, something better, a heavenly country. Hebrews 11, verse 6, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Whatever struggle you go through in life, whatever sorrow you go through in life, whatever pain you go through in life, here is what keeps us going. God has prepared for us something better. God has prepared something beyond our wildest dreams, something beyond our fondest imagination, something beyond what is. He takes us beyond time to eternity, beyond the sin of this world to the glory of the next world. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 puts it this way, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Whatever scene you have ever seen, the most magnificent sunset, God's artistry is far better. The most fantastic field or garden with all these multicolored flowers in it, reds and purples and greens and yellows. God is something more fantastic, more than eye has ever seen, more than ear has ever heard. Have you ever been to a concert, maybe a classical concert of Mozart or Beethoven? You sit back just amazed. Maybe you've gone to the hallelujah chorus and you sit there, king of kings and lord of lords, and you sit there at Handel's Messiah and you just are thrilled. But the Bible says, I have not seen or have er ear heard the things that God has prepared for those that love him. You think you've seen music down here? Wait till you hear heavenly music, the heavenly choirs, the heavenly organs, just fantastic. You think you, you have seen the beauty of artistry down here? Wait till you see what God has prepared. Probably though, the most significant thing that we're going to experience in heaven is the depth of love. You know, every human being has been created for love. And a couple has a baby, and as they have that baby, they hold their first child in their hands, and they, they just express such love in that for that child. But that love is just a miniature 
of the love that we will experience in the new heavens and the new earth. Or think of the love and the bondedness, the fellowship that friends have when you and I fellowship in heaven. We will have love beyond human capacity. There will be a capacity to love that we do not experience now. You think you love your children now. You think you love your husband or wife now. When we are living in that new earth without these bodies of selfishness, you know, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceit deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So sin narrows our capacity to love. Sin shrinks our capacity to love. Sin dumbs down that capacity to love. So whatever capacity that we have to love now is very, very small. But in heaven, we're going to have this huge capacity to love that is going to be incredibly amazing. And we will love in ways that we never know and experience love in ways that we never know. Heaven, it's fellowship, is indeed the closer than any fellowship on earth. And think of the fellowship we're going to have with angels. And think of the joy we're going to have with Jesus. And think of the love and the peace we're going to experience. There will be no feeling like the feeling and no emotion like the emotion, no sentiment like the sentiment of being embraced by God, of being loved by Jesus, about having Jesus put his arm around us and say, my child, I am so happy that you're here in eternity. My death on the cross was for you. Heaven's fellowship is going to be closer than anything we can imagine. Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 2, and see just how these last day events at the end of the thousand year millennial period will resume. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. John says, I looked up. And as I looked up, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will be with them, and they shall be his people, and he shall be their God. Here is a cosmic announcement. You know, I love the way it's put in Revelation chapter 21. And here in the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21 puts it this way. Revelation 21, it says, Behold, I saw a new heavens and a new earth, and a great voice out of heaven saying, The holy city descends from heaven. Now notice here's a great voice out of heaven. Here is a solemn announcement. Here is an announcement that goes and echoes through the whole universe of the great voice out of heaven says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. What's the tabernacle of God? In the ancient tabernacle, this is where the dwelling place of God was. This is where the Shekinah glory of God was. Now, the tabernacle of God, the cosmic control center of all the universe, the tabernacle of God descends from heaven to earth. And there's an announcement that goes out before the whole universe. God is moving. You see, now our solar system goes in circular and it is revolving around other solar systems. And you know, in the Milky Way galaxy, there are about a hundred billion, uh, rather a hundred million other galaxies, billions and billions of stars. And when you look at the universe, it's all revolving, and it's all revolving around some cosmic center. One galaxy, the next galaxy, the next galaxy, all in motion, thousands and tens of thousands of miles an hour in vast, uh, limitless space. But yet, they revolve around a cosmic control center, and that cosmic control center is the throne of God. And what's going to happen? The holy city. God's going to move. The whole center of the universe is going to move. And God's going to take this sin 
pot world, this polluted world, this planet in rebellion. He's going to make it over again, and he's going to bring his holy city down here, and the whole geographical center of the universe is going to change, and this remade earth is going to be the new center of the universe with the tabernacle of God, and you and I are going to be princes and princesses. We got royal blood in our veins, and we're going to travel from star to star and from planet to planet, telling the story of his goodness and his love. God has something amazing planned for you, my friend. That holy city will descend. God is going to move, and this earth will be the center of a new cosmic universe, and you and I will be part of the honor convoy of heaven. The Bible tells about that holy city, Revelation 21, verse 14. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Wait a minute. Hold it here. Did God make a mistake? Whose names are on there? The 12 apostles? The 12 apostles on the 12 foundations? I mean, one of those apostles was, was Peter, and he denied Jesus. And one of those apostles was James and John, and they had these evil tempers. And one was, was Matthew, who was so exacting. And uh, one was uh, Philip and Andrew. You didn't know what they were thinking. They didn't say much. I mean, who were those people whose names or on the gates. They were sinners, redeemed by the grace of Christ. They were men just and people, just like you and just like me. Why does God put their names on the foundation? Why does God put above the gates the names of the children of Israel, like Issachar and Manasseh? And uh, you look at those names of the children of Israel, Reuben. They could have been tried in a court of law for robbery, thievery, adultery, murder. But yet their names are on the gates. Why? Why the apostles, the names on the foundations? Because God is saying to you and me, if they can make it, so can you. What God is really saying is that these followers of Christ were people with their faults, but their names are on the foundations of the holy city, the apostles, the names of the nations of Israel, and the names above the gates. Why? Because God is saying to you, don't give up. God is saying to you, hang on. God is saying to you, if their names can be on those gates, if they were redeemed by the grace of Christ, justified by the blood of Christ, forgiven by the blood of Christ, delivered from, from condemnation by the blood of Christ, if they were sanctified by the blood of Christ, if they were transformed by the blood of Christ, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, if any man or woman is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away, and all things, all things are become new. Jesus was saying, if they were there, you can be there too. God is saying to us, if they can make it, you can make it too. Hold on, brother. Hold on, sister. This is no time for giving up. This is no time for dropping out. Somebody, somebody is watching this telecast, and you're thinking, the journey's long, the mountain's high, the road's rough. I'm going to give up. I'm going to throw in the towel. Christianity is not worth it. And Jesus is saying to you, hang on. Jesus is saying to you, you can make it. Jesus is saying to you, I'm going to be by your side. I'm going to support you. You can live in this holy city. You can be with me, travel from star to star and planet to planet. You can give your witness of my redeeming grace. Now, the Bible tells about the city, Revelation 21, verse 16. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. The Bible goes on. You see, heaven's goal, as the Bible, as it describes the city, you see, heaven's goal is to get as many people in this city as possible. Now, there's something unusual about this city that we just read about that has a square. When you excavate as an archaeologist, when you excavate ancient cities in Israel, most of those cities have very few gates, maybe two gates, maybe three gates, very few gates. Why do you think that the ancient cities had so few gates? You have any idea why? Because gates would allow the enemy access to that city. So you have very few gates because if you have a lot of gates, you've got to guard a lot of gates with your armies. So the ancient cities would have few gates. But you know what? God's city has more 
than a few gates. The holy city has not one gate, not two gates, not three gates. How many gates does the holy city have, everybody? Twelve. Why twelve? Because God wants to get people in. He doesn't want to get people out. Now, more, it says the city's like a what? What did we read in the text? The city is like a, a square. So, four sides. Three gates on the north, three gates on the east, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Three in the Bible is a symbol of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Four in the Bible is a symbol of universality. So what, God, what is God saying? Three gates on the east. Everybody in the east, all you from Asia, all you from China, there's room for you, come in. Three gates on the south, all you from the southern hemisphere, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are saying, come on in, there's room for you. Three gates on the west, all you from the west, you come on in. Three gates on the north, all you from the northern hemisphere, North America, Canada, you all come in. What is God saying in the architecture of the holy city? He is saying, there's a gate for you. It's open for you. You come in to that city. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was a pearl. Jesus Christ is the pearl of great price. And Jesus is saying through the very architecture of the gates, my perfect life as a translucent pearl invites you to receive my grace and my love and my righteousness. The gates of heaven are open for you. Here's incredible good news, my friend. The gates of heaven are not shut. The gates of heaven are not shut. The gates of heaven are open for you. Eternity is open for you. God has prepared something for you beyond what you could ever imagine. The Bible describes the city, Revelation 21, verse 21. God's not poor. The street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Somebody says, wait a minute. That's a waste to make streets of gold. It's not a waste because you're that important to God. It's not a waste because he has everything. It's not a waste because he owns the world. You see, God himself says there is nothing too little to give you. He loves you so much that he paves streets with gold just to show you how much he cares in your worth. Whoever you are, you can make it through one of those gates. Whoever you are, you can walk through those gates. Whoever you are, you can live in heaven with him through all eternity. Now he measures the city and he measures with it a reed and it's 12,000 furlongs. Now that's a little difficult for our modern minds to comprehend. We don't measure things in furlongs. A furlong was about an eighth of a mile. 12,000 furlongs is about 1,500 miles. So the city is about 375 miles on a side. Now somebody says, wait a minute, you're going to be able to fit everybody in that city? Well, if you got a city 375 miles on a side and that, you know, if you just build on the horizontal, you can fill, put millions and millions and millions of people in the city. I mean, you take, for example, New York City. It's just 20 miles across, not even in a square, and you got, you know, 15 to 20 million people there. So you get a city 375 miles on one side. Don't worry about it. You got millions and millions of people. But look, God can build multiple stories. He, God can build in the sky if he needs to. And not only will we have city homes, but we'll, we got the whole new earth. We'll have country homes. Don't worry about it. There's enough room for you, my brother. There's enough room for you, my sister. God is something incredibly prepared. Its length and breadth and height are equal. Now, there's another one that's interesting. Its length and breadth, you know, 375 miles on a side, but its height is equal. In other words, the city is so amazing, it goes 375 miles up in the sky. You say, I can't figure that out. I can't either, but don't worry about it. It's still true because God said it, right? So this city is going to be so incredible. It's going to be so amazing, far beyond. What was our text that we read? Eye has not seen nor ear heard anything that God has prepared for those that love him. Far beyond our wildest imaginations. No artist can paint a picture of it. No musician can describe it in music, beyond what you can even think or imagine. It's beyond your wildest dreams. The beauty, the joy of this new heavens and new earth. The beauty of Eden made over again. Isaiah chapter 35 puts it this way, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Just think of the beautiful flowers, the perfumed air, the beauty of Eden will be restored. 
everything that brings joy, everything that brings gladness, walking down those paths, smelling the magnificence of the flowers, looking at their reds and the pinks and the yellows and the oranges and the greens, nothing that we could possibly see or imagine here on earth, the most beautiful garden would ever hold a candle, ever be a small reflection of the beauties of heaven. What will our physical condition be on this new earth? Will I kind of float by on a cloud and be some kind of uh, ethereal fantasy being? And will I go beep, beep, and my wife float by on another cloud and she'll go beep, beep, and I'll say, is, is that you, darling, over there in that kind of cloudy figure? Will we know one another in heaven? What will heaven be like? The Bible helps us. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, for our citizenship, that's where we really belong, is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body. So our bodies are corrupt with sin. They are mortal bodies. They are lowly bodies, subject to disease and death, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. When Jesus lived on earth, did he have a real body? Could, was Jesus hungry at times? Did Jesus get tired at times? When the nails were driven through Jesus' hands, were those real hands? Did his hands really experience pain? When they put the crown of thorns on his head, was it real? So Jesus had a real body. When he came out of the grave in the resurrected body, was that body different? It was a glorified body that could not experience aging. It could not experience hunger or pain. Um, so Jesus had a glorious body. What does the Bible say? It says that Christ will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. So Christ has this glorious, resurrected, immortal body. When he walked with the disciples, on the road to Emmaus. And as he walked with them, he had a real body. He talked with them. He fellowshiped with them. The Bible says that their eyes were holden, that they didn't recognize him. But when they came that evening to sit down, and Jesus broke the bread that they would all share together, now, evidently, Jesus, in his immortal body, still enjoyed the eating of food. We will, too, in our immortal bodies. So, but when Jesus broke that bread, he had unique mannerisms. Nobody broke the bread like Jesus. And as he broke that bread, they recognized Christ at that moment by his unique mannerisms. Do you remember also that in the garden, after Christ's resurrection, Mary comes to Jesus. And at first, through the mist, she does not recognize him. She thinks he's the gardener. And Jesus says, Mary, Mary. And as he calls her name, nobody could speak her name like that. Jesus knew her name. She recognized his voice. So Jesus was recognized in his glorious body by his unique mannerisms. He was recognized in his glorious body by his voice. And you remember he descended into the room where the disciples were met as they were praying. They were afraid of the Jews, the Bible says, and they recognized his physical form. So Jesus was recognized by these three things. In heaven, Will we recognize one another? Sure. Jesus doesn't want to redeem or save some spirit being. He wants you. He created you with the uniqueness of your personality. And although sin will be gone, you'll still remain as the special one that Christ created. He still will remit your still your personality will remain the uniqueness of your mannerisms will remain you will have this amazing body that is immortal we'll recognize one another by our unique mannerisms by our voice intonations by our individual personalities it'll be incredible as you and I see one another as we were meant to be you know husband you may think your wife is beautiful now but wait till you see her like she would have been if she never were defiled by sin at all. You know, some people say to me, well, look, 
I'm going to buy this magic formula. I'm going to put this wrinkle cream on my face and I'll never get a wrinkle. Well, my dear sister, you can put as much on as you want if it makes you feel better, but you're going to a place where you're going to be remade and you will not have one wrinkle. And you know, some guys, they're getting a little older like me and they bend over and say, oh, my back. You know, here's what the definition of aging is. You bend over to tie your shoe and you say, what else can I do when I'm down here? You see, that's the definition. That's the definition of aging, you see. And, uh, you know, but when God recreates you. No wrinkle cream you're going to need. You're not going to need any uh, uh, back adjustments. Crack, crack, crack. You know, they adjust your back. You're not going to need to worry when you bend over. No more arthritis or rheumatism. But we are going to grow into the beauty of what we were meant to be when we were created by God in the Garden of Eden. You think your husband is muscular now, man? Wait till you see him in the glories of the new heaven and the new earth. You see, the Bible says the first dominion, this is Micah 4, verse 8, the first dominion will be restored. God is going to bring us to that new heavens and the new earth. Everything we would have been, everything we could have been, everything we should have been, the physical bodies that we could have had, the minds that we could have had, you know, it is the intelligence of a person is determined by the forebrain. You know, the brain is about three and a half pounds of rubbery gray substance. And in the forebrain, we have our brain cells. You know, the brain has about a hundred, I used to say 14 billion until I talk to a uh, neurophysiologist. You know, we got billions and billions of brain cells. We don't even know how many. And uh, when you look at the brain, the forebrain determines intelligence or IQ. And uh, the brains in our body may be three and a half pounds. But look, think about Adam. What about Adam when he wasn't defiled with sin? How tall could he have been? Maybe twice as tall, a little more than we are today? What kind of brain would he have if our brains are three and a half pounds and if somebody has an IQ of 120, 115 to 120, they say maybe that's average, 130 that's bright, 140 that's off the charts, 150, 60 that's genius. Oh, they got this three and a half pounds or rubbery gray substance, this little brain with the brain cells. You know how big Adam's brain probably was? If he was twice as tall as men living, his brain was probably 25 pounds. That means that his IQ would have been probably 1,000 or 1,200. I mean, the intelligence is so vastly greater than ours. Now, if Adam was twice as tall as men living, you know, we had a scientist, and he took a little, um, a little slide rule, and he computed it. Adam's average gait, average gait of walking, if he's twice as tall as men living, could be about 25 miles an hour. That's his average gait of walking. I mean, look, we have no comprehension of what God has in store for us. Isaiah 33, verse 24, the inhabitant will not say, I am sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. No more stomach aches, no more headaches, no more back aches, no more knee aches. The inhabitant will not say, I am what, everybody? Sick. What is it going to be like to live in a world where there is no sickness. The eyes of the blind will be open. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The eyes of the blind opened. You know, for many years, my wife and I would visit a hospital that was especially for the physically handicapped. And we'd often go there and, and teach Bible. And there were those who was, I remember Doris. She was blind and could not see. She was paralyzed and couldn't use her hands or feet. Uh, all she could do was hear. And we would sing a song to her and say, you can smile when you can't say a word. You can smile when you cannot be heard. You can smile anytime, anywhere. And Doris would smile, you know. I remember little Jimmy. He came into our Bible classes on a board with wheels. He had no legs and he'd pull himself along the floor in these wheels. And I remember Joni. She was paralyzed from her neck down couldn't use her hands. She had polio when 1948 she got bulbar polio, was the longest living person in an iron lung. She would lie in that iron lung and put her Bible above her head and turn the pages with her tongue and she'd memorize large 
passages of the Bible and I'd visit her and she'd say, Pastor Mark, I'm studying the Bible with 21 people and, and I've had them filling out the lessons. They're over there in the third drawer, pull out the lessons and read me the questions and the answers and I'll tell you if they're right because she had memorized everything. Just amazing. She refused to be down on herself, refused to be sympathetic for herself. She was this woman with this indomitable, courageous spirit. And I remember we would go there and I'd say, what do you want to me to teach in Bible class today. They would say, Pastor, teach us about heaven. Teach us about the time that the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Pastor, teach us about heaven. I said, well, you know, didn't I teach about that last week? Didn't I teach about that? They said, Pastor, teach us more because we forgot. <laughs> so often we forget. We forget the glories of heaven. We forget the reality of eternity. We forget that we're simply pilgrims here, but that God has something incredibly better for us. The Bible says, the lame shall leap like a deer. The tongue of the dumb will sing. Just think of what it's going to be like. The eyes of the blinds open. The ears of the deaf unstop. The lame leaping and joyously running through the glorious fields and flowers of heaven. There's joy and happiness everywhere. No crying children. No children crying out for food. No children whose parents have died and are orphans because all of us there will be part of the larger family of heaven. All of us there will be in a society where love reigns. The Bible says, Revelation 21 verse 4, God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death nor sorrow, nor crying. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There may be a pain in your heart today, my friend. There may be sorrow in your life today, but God is going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more pain for the former things are passed away. Even the memory of heartache, even the memory of sorrow, even the memory of pain will be gone. Death, a thing of the past. Sorrow, a thing of the past. Crying, a thing of the past. Pain, a thing of the past. Forever gone, forever gone. The Bible says, Revelation 22, verse 1, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and from the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, this is a little confusing. This is Revelation chapter 22. Why does the Bible say the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations? Because in Revelation 22, the nations have been healed, right? There is no sickness. The Bible said that in Revelation 22. You see this word healing, you know what it means? In the original language, it's upbuilding or restoration. So the leaves of the tree are for the upbuilding. The leaves of the tree are for the restoration of the nations. What does that mean? We go and take the tree of life every month. Now, when you and I come out of the grave, I will come out of the grave with a glorious immortal body, but about six feet. My wife will come out of the grave about the size she is. But when Adam comes out of the grave with his mortal body, he will come out maybe twice as tall as me, maybe 13 feet. But you know what? As you and I eat of the tree of life, we will be fully restored and grow and grow and grow until our perfect size that we would have been in and will continue to grow mentally in our capacity because when we come to heaven, we're not going to know everything. So as we eat the tree, as we study in heaven, we're going to grow mentally, we're going to grow physically. So what this is talking about is the total restoration of humanity. Certainly there's no sickness, certainly there's no suffering, but isn't there a lot of growing to do in heaven? We're all going to grow continually to be like we would have been in that Garden of Eden. We're going to be loved by God, cherished by God, embraced by God, satisfied by God. The Bible says that heaven is indeed a real place. Isaiah 65 verse 17, no make-believe world, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered to come to mind. 
What's God going to do? Just like it says in Revelation, create a new heavens and a new earth. What are we going to do through the ceaseless ages of eternity? Will it be boring? Isaiah 65, verse 21 and 22, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree shall be the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. You may live in a little apartment now. You may live now in a two-room apartment. You may be struggling to pay your rent. You may have a little shabby home now, but the Bible says they'll build houses and inhabit them. Have you ever had your dream home? Your dream home by the side of a lake your dream home overlooking a field with beautiful gardens. Have you ever longed for that? One day you can have that home. You'll have your apartment in the city in the new Jerusalem and your dream home in the country. Somebody says, well, pastor, I'm not sure I, I know how to build it. Don't worry. The greatest architects of the ages will be there. Somebody says, pastor, I don't have enough money to fund it. Don't worry. The Bible says that the cattle on 10,000 hills are God's and the silver and gold is God's. Don't worry. You'll have all the support you need. The greatest architects, the greatest builders, the greatest designers. Heaven's going to be amazing, isn't it? You know what I think? Often we make heaven too far away. We make heaven too fantasiful. We make it too ethereal. But it's a real place with real people, with real bodies. It's a real place where the Bible says that we'll have real gardens and we will eat the fruit of them. You think the fruit's going to be puny like we see it now? You think the apples are going to need to be sprayed 10 times. In fact, some apples are sprayed 10 times with pestilences. You think that's going to happen up there? Not at all. I can imagine maybe apples. What size? Three times as big? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, when you think of it, I mean, how many people is it going to take to, to carry a watermelon in heaven? <laughs> I mean, and a banana, and a banana. I mean, wow. Banana may be that long, I mean, think of the fruit sizes in heaven and think of the taste. You know, one of the fantastic things that we can't even imagine is our taste buds are defiled by sin, aren't they? So we don't have the taste buds that we had in Eden. Neither does the fruit taste as good as it would have in Eden. So if you get a strawberry the size of an apple and you get taste buds like Adam and Eve had, I mean, wow, that's all I can say is, wow, that's going to be incredibly amazing, isn't it? Now, what about fellowship and friends? Will we spend time with one another and friends in heaven? Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 says, I say to you, many are going to come from the east and the west, and they're going to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. You know, Often, when I'm speaking to large audiences in big auditoriums, after the meeting, I try to go to the door and shake people's hand. I shake their hand. Hello, hello, hello. You know, you, you, you're trying to shake people's hand. They're all over the place. And, and, oh, pastor, can we take a picture? Yes, and I'm smiling, you know. And, but I don't get to know people well. You know, I see them for a little while. But they pass by. But what does Scripture say? In heaven. We'll sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Imagine what it's going to be like. That one day you're working in your garden. One day you're picking a beautiful bouquet of flowers. And you look over there and you say, hey, I think that, is that, could that be Moses? And you pick one of those large bananas. And it's weighted down on your shoulder. And you walk over and say, Moses, how'd you like to share a banana? Or you pick a strawberry the size of an apple. Hey, Moses, you want one of my strawberries? Moses, I, I was admiring your watermelons. And Moses, I never saw fruit like that before. What's that? And he explains you some new exotic heavenly fruit. And you sit with Moses and say, Moses, tell me what it was like to go up on the Mount Sinai and hear the thunderous roar and uh, the thunderings of God and receive the Ten Commandments. Moses, do you have time? And Moses says, this is eternity. I got all the time in the world. Sit down. <laughs> and he talks to you about what it was like to go on Sinai. One day you're walking down the road of heaven. You're admiring the flowers in somebody's garden. And you say, by the way, sir, what's your name? My name's Daniel. What's your name? Daniel. Are you the Daniel in the Bible? Yeah, I am. 
Can we sit and tell me, were well, you really scared in that lion's den? <laughs> I mean, tell me about those lions, Daniel. And Daniel looks at you and says, tell me your story. You lived in the last hours of earth's history. Tell me your story, my child. Tell me what it was like to be faithful to Christ down there. And then you see Paul and you say, Paul, tell me what it was like to preach and to share your love and grace. Isn't heaven going to be wonderful? I don't want to miss it, do you? I don't want to miss it with fellowship. And then one day, one day you meet Jesus. And one day you walk and talk and fellowship with Jesus. And the scripture says that we walked with him and we see his face and the glory of Christ amazes us. We see how good and kind and compassionate he is. And Sabbath comes. Isaiah 63, 66, verse 23. From one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord God. They come from the east and the west. They come from the north and the south. And they come to worship on the Bible Sabbath. And all the brothers and sisters, all the family of heaven comes. And we enter that holy temple. We enter that new Jerusalem and we sing praises to his name and we sing worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive riches and honor and glory forever and ever and ever. And then on the way out that Sabbath, Jesus reaches out to us and Jesus says, my child, can I spend some time with you this week? We've only seen him in a distance. We've never been this close to him before. And we say, Jesus, do you have time? And he said, my child, this is eternity. I want to tell you how much I love you. I want to tell you how much I care for you. And that week, you and I take a walk with Jesus. We're by ourselves. You have your walk, I have my walk. He comes to you on one day and comes to me on another. And we walk through a field of flowers more beautiful. And Jesus says, you see those flowers? I planted them there just for you because I knew you'd like them. The Bible says, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he'll dwell with them. Christ dwells with us. Christ dwells with us. They shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, they shall see his face. We shall see Jesus and we'll walk with him. We'll talk with him. We'll fellowship with him. He'll say, you see that field of waving grain? It is just for you. I, I know your taste buds. There's no other variety like it. I planted it for you. You see those flowers. I knew you'd enjoy them. And we hear the angel choruses singing. And then Jesus says, is there anything more that I can do for you? Is there anything more that would make you happy? And we fall on our knees and we say, Jesus, all this is wonderful. But you are enough. You're enough, Jesus. You're all that I want. Heaven is too good to be missed. Have you given your all to Jesus? Have you given your everything to Jesus? Listen as CA sings right now. Do you love God more than anything? Do you love God? Do you love God more than anything? Do you love my God? Love is all that he asks in return for all. God more than your car or home. Do you love God? And do you love God more than all you own? Do you love my God? Do you love God? family really really love him if you do just let 
the whole world know that's all he asks of you. Do you love God more than that car or home? Do you love God? And do you love God more than everything you own? Do you love my God? Tell me, do you love God more than your family? Really, really, really love him. If you do, just let the whole world know that you love the Lord. Come on, let the whole world know. Let them know that you love the Lord. Let the whole world know. Let the whole world know. Let the whole world know. That's all. Jesus died so that one day you could live in heaven with him. Jesus came to this earth for one reason, because you were too precious to be lost. And right now he's speaking to your heart. Wherever you are watching this telecast, Christ is speaking to you. That warmth you feel in your heart, that conviction you feel in your mind is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Christ wants you in heaven more than you can possibly imagine. You know in your heart, whether you've ever accepted Christ before, whether you're a Christian or not, you know in your heart that you long for something better. You long for this new world that there is in Christ. And right now, wherever you are, you can make an eternal decision and say, Christ, I'm giving my life to you. I want to live with you forever. He accepts you right now and will give you that assurance that eternal life is yours in Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, right now men and women and boys and girls by the hundreds, thousands are coming to you. Your arms are open. You accept them. Thank you, Jesus, for the hope and the assurance that we can live with you in heaven forever. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you, my friend. As you continue to walk with Jesus, now and forevermore. Amen.